Good evening, viewers from India and across the globe. Uh, my name is Chamo Yantan. I'm president of the Naga Scholars Association. Okay, let's start. First of all, I take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you who are gathered here. Uh, we are very thankful to each and every one of you for taking out the time to join us on the NSA webinar on the topic, politics of food. This is a very interesting uh, topic. And well, uh, this evening we are extremely privileged to have so many, uh, you know, I should say excellent uh, panelists. And we, everyone is really looking forward. And uh, well, uh, maybe it's good on my part to directly straight away because we have already wasted little time. Let me straight away go to the introduction of the panelists. To start with, I would like to uh, give a very brief introduction about uh, the chairperson for today's uh, panel discussion. That is, that is uh, Dr. Dolly Kikon. Uh, Dolly Kikon, she is a senior lecturer in the Anthropology and Development Studies program at the University of Melbourne, Australia. She has received her PhD degree from, uh, from the Department of Anthropology from Stanford University. And after that, she did her postdoctoral studies from Stockholm University in Sweden. And well, uh, you know, prior to that, she received bachelor's degree in law from University of Delhi and practice in the Supreme Court of India at Guwahati uh, High Court in Assam. Her legal advocacy, you know, works and research continue to focus on land uh, ownership and resources management in Northeast India, uh, including, you know, extra constitutional regulations like the, you know, uh, Armed Force uh, Special Powers uh, Act 1958. And Dolly Kikon is the author of uh, Living with the Oil, Living the Land and Life and Dignity and so many uh, research, uh, you know, papers she has published. Thank you very much, Dr. Dolly Kikon, for, you know, for accepting our invitation to be one of the panelists for today's panel discussion. Thank you very much. Secondly, we have, uh, you know, the panelists, we have uh, Dr. Kiran Mai Kushi. She is a faculty in, uh, faculty of sociology in the School of Social Sciences in Indragani National Open University. She did her PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University and she had a teaching experience at Columbia College that is in Chicago, USA. And she also taught in Ambedkar University, Delhi. And she was a visiting faculty at University of Venice, Italy. And her main academic research interests lie in the area of diaspora studies, migration and transformationalism food studies and popular culture. She has published uh, several articles and research papers in leading journals. And our recent publication is from the Cambridge publication. Thank you very much, Dr. Kiran, uh, for accepting our invitation to be one of the panelists for today's uh, webinar. And thirdly, we have uh, Dr. Ejingbeni Humzoe Nenu. She is a principal of Baptist Theological College in Nagaland. And Ayingbeni did her PhD from South East, Southeast Asia Graduate College of Theology at Trinity Theological College, Singapore. And she was a faculty at Clark Theological College, teaching uh, systematic theology and gender studies. And she was also at the you know, faculty at you know, Eastern Theological College in Clark, Jorahat. And she is the author of uh, books, uh, several books, which includes God of the Tribes, uh, Latinance of the All Occasions, at, I'm sorry, and Naga Essays for Responsible Change. Thank you very much, Dr. Ejungbeni Humtsoi, for accepting our invitation to be one of the panelists for today's webinar. Well, we have uh, Dr. Jelly. He is the head of Department of Political Science and Sociology at a Royal Timbu uh, College, that is a university, uh, you know, in Royal Timbu uh, University. 
and he holds an MPhil uh, with a distinction in anthropology from University of Oxford and a PhD anthropology from Northeastern Hill University. Prior to joining uh, Royal Dimbu College, he also taught at Sikkim Central University and uh, at Perth Hart. I don't know if I pronounce it well, in one of the universities in, in Germany. And he is the author of the book, uh, In the Shadow, Shadow of the Naga Insurgency Tribes, States, State and Violence in Northeast, and Naga as a Society, you know, against voting and other essays. And also, Naga's in the 21st century and democracy in Nagaland. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jelly for accepting our invitation uh, to join us. Uh, Jelly is joining us all the way from uh, Udan. And of course, Dolly Gigon, the chairperson is joining us all the way from Australia. And well, lastly, but not the least, we have another very dynamic uh, young scholar, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Sam, we call him Sam, but his official name is Dr. Sam Bai Gundi uh, Meda. Well, he's a faculty of political science in Azim Bramji University in Bangalore. And well, Dr. Sam, he graduated from political science from University of Hyderabad and did his PhD from University of London. And he was also a Charles Wallace uh, visiting fellow at the University of Edinburgh, a visiting associate fellow at a center for the study of developing societies, New Delhi, and also fellow associate professor at Nehru Memorial, uh, Nehru Memori Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi, and author of Talit Politics and Contemporary India, New York, uh, Rodledge Publication, and many other more research uh, publications. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sam, for accepting our you know, invitation to be one of the panelists for today. Well, once again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists and the chairperson for giving us this opportunity you know, to have you in NSA's uh, platform. Well, we also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, today's, uh, you know, Technical support is from uh, none other than, uh, you know, Ralat Jadav, uh, Kamlesh and Ankush uh, from Mumbai. Thank you very much for being always available for uh, NSA. Yes. And we also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Repudir is uh, Meno who is a PhD scholar in Data Institute of Social Sciences. In fact, uh, she has written a very good article on today's topic. And so uh, it's very, we have a very good uh, team today, you know, very good chairperson. We have a very excellent, again, panelists and also a very good rapporteur. And of course, you know, a very supporting technical support. And we also would like to acknowledge the, you know, acknowledge the designer of our webinar, uh, you know, flyer, Mr. Russell Hunzoi. Thank you very much, Russell Hunzoi, for always, you know, being available for NSA. So I also would like to uh, thank all the participants for taking out the time to join us in today's discussion. So now, without wasting any time, I would like to give the time to our chairperson for today's uh, panel discussion. That is the Dr. Uh, Tori Kikon. He's coming all the way from Melbourne University, Australia. Yeah, back to you, Dr. Dolly. Hello, uh, Dolly. Um. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> I was I was I was not able to unmute. Um thank you so okay. much. Um, and so I I'm very I think privileged to to be part of uh, the the um, Naga Scholars Association um, 
wonderful meeting. Thank you for inviting me to, to share this. Uh, and I'm, I'm zooming in from Melbourne in Australia and I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in this country, the indigenous people. And so as I live and work here in this country on indigenous land, I would like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, um, elders past and present on which this meeting where I'm zooming from is taking place. And on that note, I would like to thank the Naga Scholars Association in keeping with the true tradition and culture of having around half an hour for thanks, and for thanking the panelists and for ma making sure that the biographies and the profiles are read very well. This has been a very long Naga tradition where if the meeting is one and a half hours, we spend around half an hour in the beginning <laughs> to do this. And, and so it's going on very well. Um, and without much, I think, uh, you know, time wasted, I would like to give the time to the panels. And if it's okay, we will go according to the name that I have. First, Dr. Kiran, second, Dr. Aying Bini, uh, third, uh, Dr. Yele, and, and, and the fourth speaker uh, for the panel would be Dr. Sam. Uh, as, as I noted, you have seven minutes each, and by the fifth minute, uh, please time yourself. If not, I'm just going to show this um, and, and, and make sure that, you know, by the time you see this, you are winding up your, your um, talk, uh, your, your reflections. Uh, we have a very amazing uh, number of participants here, 88. It's going live on Facebook. And your, your contacts will be there with the students and with the participants after the meeting as well. So they can contact you all individually in terms of questions they have. So I would not like to waste any more time, but make sure that I, as the chair, have some basic rules for this meeting. First, as the chair, I would like to request organizers that we will not tolerate any language that, that is racist, that is sexist, that is, um, um, in a sense, not sensitive to the harmony that we have here in this meeting. It's a safe space where we have come together to discuss on a very sensitive topic and a topic that is very close to our heart as citizens in this country, in India. And this is also a gathering where I recognize that tribals, Dalits, thinkers, students alike have come together to have a conversation. Once again, as the chair, I would like to underline that this is a safe space. Anyone who shows disrespect to any of the participants in conversation or in question wise will be asked to leave or will be muted. And in a sense, asked to, I will ask the organizers to make sure that that, that is stopped right away. So, so without much ado, uh, Dr. Kiran, can I give you the time if you are here? I'm here. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Naga Scholars Association. Thank you, Zuchamo, for uh, inviting me to this uh, topic. You know, I mean, food is every day and yet it gets relegated. So I'm really glad that you thought of organizing a webinar on uh, politics of food. And uh, as Do Dolly mentioned, it's uh, uh, well, it's a meaty matter, so there might be some things which might uh, disturb people. So let me start straight away, actually. So uh, where do I begin? Because the canvas is really vast. Uh, see, I taught a course on food and society for the undergrads in uh, Ambedkar University. You know, the moment we announced this course, we had quite a few students who wanted to be part of the, uh, you know, who opted for this course. It was open for uh, the general uh, student population uh, for all the undergrads. Uh, so I had quite a few students and, uh, you know, they were a little disappointed. They had to do quite a bit, bit of reading, but I had to make it as exciting and learning uh, a, as much as possible. So I, I organized my students into groups of six or seven, you know, and we did a series of exercises. I, I like to mention this, you know, because I think it's a good entry point to understand how uh, a food pretty much straddles all aspects of the society. 
it's basically uh, a sort of a mediation through which we can see how the society expresses itself. Uh, one of the groups that was asked to take up an exercise was, see, I wanted the students to understand how income levels affect what you eat and how you look at food actually. So uh, these uh, seven students were asked to uh, do a small little survey. It was also an introduction to doing surveys and the survey involved them to collect or do an inventory of uh, food that children ate uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I asked them to do two sets of uh, class of people, uh, middle class, for which they could ask their neighbors or you know, um, their families, uh, extended kin, so on and so forth, friends, and working class, you know, the, the maids, the drivers, and so on and so forth. It was not a very big sample. Uh, six of them did the 10 each. And, uh, you know, I remember the discussions which came up in the, uh, in the course of uh, unpacking what we got as a bit of sample, uh, you know, uh, data. Uh, nearly 80% of these children from the working class backgrounds were having tea for breakfast and maybe biscuits. And I, I remember some of the students coming to me later and talking to me personally that they were a little disturbed. And I was very, very happy that they were you know, it kind of shook them. But this was also an entry point to understand uh, as a class, um, group of learners and me as a teacher, uh, what were the state interventions in trying to understand this large scale uh, food poverty that we have in India? If you look at the, the figures, they're staggering. We have almost, uh, something around 189.2 million malnourished people in India. I mean, that's astounding. You know, we have almost 40% of, of children below five who are malnourished. You know, I think uh, the state intervention in terms of midday meal scheme is one of those efforts. But before I go into whether the midday meal scheme was successful or not, and I'm not even going to go into details about that. But uh, our class also discovered that the midday meal scheme was riddled with so many social uh, structural aspects. You know, the fact that Dalit children were not allowed to sit with the same uh, children or cooks who happened to be Dalit were not allowed to cook so on and so forth. You know, uh, apart from that, we also discovered that uh, uh, the in the early phase of India, post-independent India, in the 60s or the 50s, when uh, one was figuring out what should be the minimum allowance, daily allowance of uh, nutritional food, uh, one of the directors of National uh, Nutri uh, Institute of uh, Nutrition, which is based in Hy Hyderabad, uh, she mentioned, I remember there was an interview where she talked about how many of the planners uh, came from vegetarian upper class or upper caste backgrounds. And so they tended to concentrate on pulses and cereals. And, you know, so... Um, you know, our PDA scheme, that is the public distribution scheme, as well as our midday meal scheme, are in a way uh, defined by a certain notion of nutrition or certain backgrounds or uh, interest. You know, I mean, that's one of the things that my uh, students, uh, you know, started to... Several uh, six or seven groups, a group of students, and one of which was which they found quite entertaining was to uh, look around for those restaurants which had very prominently displayed 
you know, you, you must have come across in Delhi restaurants which say Indian, South Indian, Chinese, Mughlai, you know, a whole combination or a slew of them. So they picked up these restaurants which uh, said Indian. Well, the South Indian also figured there, like pretty much like South India is like the Vatican of India, you know, a separate entity. Uh, but uh, so what was interesting is uh, they did a, a little um, look at the menu. They collected all the menus and we wanted to see how is India represented in that menu, which was quite uh, interesting for my students because uh, most of them were, uh, when you say India, I, should, I think that menu actually was talking about North mm -hmm. India. And uh, so, uh, you know, following this, there was a discussion in the class as to what is not represented in that menu, which is Indian. And uh, we looked for some glaring omissions. And uh, of course, the Northeast came up very strongly. The whole swash of uh, tribal India, which is, you know, which is something that never is talked about in the uh, any kind of food discussion and uh, so I asked the students you know like uh, what do you think should come up in this menu like let's say think of one or two items that maybe should figure uh, from some of these neglected parts of India especially the tribal uh, areas and uh, it's interesting you know nobody could really come up with the uh, I remember two, three of them, they said momos, you know, which, which again surprised me because I think that's what they thought was from the Northeast. Um, some did say a few things like uh, bamboo shoot uh, dishes or whatever, uh, which also brought us to a discussion on how do we represent a particular region through its cuisine? Do we, uh, does one represent oneself uh, does it have to be someone else's representation because many of these representations often have very stereotypical connotations you know like we often think of you know all muslims and dalits eat beef i mean that's not necessarily true and if they have uh, championed the cause of uh, you know, the right to eat beef, it's because I think they have felt it is, uh, it's a matter of uh, not only a fundamental right, but a, a matter of identity and not necessarily that everybody who um, took this position ate beef. So, you know, one of the things that we tried to unravel in my classes was these stereotypes that revolve around food. In fact, uh, these stereotypes you know, essentialize a whole range of communities. And we're all all too familiar with uh, a kind of nicknames that we give to each other, uh, strictly by uh, the food that they eat or we think they eat. You know, I mean, uh, that's true of uh, now with the, I the think dog. Kiran, you are taking a little more time. You have to run off fast. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So I'll, I, I will just stop here because I just wanted to uh, kind of, introduce the topic. Thank you. Hi, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I can I ask the can I ask the panelists to please time yourself because you know I, I once you start speaking, I can't unmute myself. So, so, and I don't think you're reading the message that I'm trying to send. So, uh, Aying, is Aying here? No? Um, can, can we go to Yele? Thank you so much, Kieran. I took down notes and what you're saying is so important. So I think as we are discussing different themes during the discussion, it will come up. So thank you so much. Um, Yele, are you here? Can, can I can I give the time to Yele if Aying is not here? Perhaps when she comes in. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Aying. Yeah, time is yours. Seven minutes. Yeah, right, I'm here. <laughs> so much. I keep. Being...
Hello, Ian. We are not able to hear you. Uh, Dolly, I think uh, Aging is already locked out again by uh, some problems there, connectivity. Maybe we can go to the next panelist. Um, can, can someone, can the host please give me the, the co-hosting for unmuting and muting? It, as, as the chair, I can't do this otherwise. It, it, it's, quite, it, it's quite difficult. Um, so, okay, so can we go to Yele then? Yele, are you here? Uh, you have to unmute your mic. Yeah, yeah. so I would, I would request the organizers to give the mute and unmute co-hosting to the panelists actually, so that they can, un they can mute when they are uh, listening and they can unmute in terms of having a conversation. So yeah, so the panelists, including the chair, thank you so much. So Yale, can you please take the time? Thank you, you have seven minutes, please time yourself, thank you. Yes. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Sujamo, and thank you to the Naga Scholars Association for, for having me. Uh, thank you also uh, to Dr. Kiran for the first um, kind of contribution. I think my contribution will be um, a little bit more specific and uh, with regard to meat and also with regard to the, the dog meat ban in Nagaland uh, specifically. I've never really worked on the anthropology of food explicitly, but I have worked on, on identity and racism, and I hope I'll be able to um, contribute at least a little to this discussion. So uh, starting with meat, um, let's start with the elemental basics, right? Humans are omnivores that eat both animals and plants, and our most convincing evidence for this is, of course, our teeth, right? We have both sharp incisors and uh, canines like carnivores and chewing molars like herbivores. So another basic fact is that humans need protein to survive and that throughout most of human history, meat functioned as the prime supplier of protein. So while vegan and animal activists may have good reason to try and reverse this evolutionary trend, the alternatives they, they offer often seem to require a kind of middle-class privilege. So for most people, occasional meat consumption is simply a necessity and is likely to remain so for uh, the foreseeable um, future. Now this brings us to the next question. And this is the question about what animals are and aren't legitimate sources of protein. And this question I argue is not one of measured fact, but one of religious and cultural preference. Consequently, it is very hard to argue whether pigs, chickens, fish, buffalo, snake, cows, dogs, and so forth should or shouldn't be eaten purely on biological ground. Even those calling, for instance, for a nationwide beef ban do not ground their arguments in terms of biology or nutrition. That would make for an argument that cannot be won. So whether an animal then is to be treated as a pet for agricultural or pastoralist utility or as an object of veneration and worship, or as a potential dish, and note of course that these categories are far from mutually exclusive, is a question of culturally certified general will, not of universal judgment or advancement. Now, relatedly, food habits and practices signify a kind of affective, aesthetic, and ethical expressions of cultural identity. So to legally prescribe, and this is in relation to the, the ban on dog meat in Nagaland, to which I will now turn. So to legally prescribe a community from eating a culturally validated dish amounts to demanding them to discard a part of their traditional identity. Now, when it comes to the recent um, dog meat ban in, in Nagaland, a lot has been said by um, a lot of different voices. 
And here I would just like to point out a few, a few aspects of it. First of all, the Nagaland government banning the trade and consumption of consumption was not made explicit, but of course um, it is in a way implicit. Um, uh, by doing so, uh, the Nagaland government ventured into the Naga kitchen. And I think one can make an argument that together with the bedroom, the kitchen is a sacred space where no government really should dare to enter. That is supposed to be uh, a private kind of a private. Um, it seems I lost some connection. Um, I hope I'm audible. We are hearing you. We are okay. able to hear you. Okay, thank you. I hope I'm, I'm audible now. Let me just make another one or two uh, quick points. So how should we understand uh, the Nagaland government self-imposing a ban on what to some Naga communities is considered to be a cultural delicacy? In my understanding, this ban uh, evidences the kind of compression of multiculturalism as a value. And arguably, the most concerning evidence of, of this whole kind of retreat of liberal and, of liberal and pluralist values that shaped the Indian constitution Right? It's not when a majority government prohibits the cultural tradition of its minorities. What is perhaps way more disturbing is when multiculturalism has already been threatened and diminished to such an extent that minority communities themselves resort to self-censuring and the erasing of perhaps even apologizing for their nevertheless deeply rooted cultural differences as expressed through food habits. So the Nagaland government legally proscribing its own people from eating a culturally authenticated dish evidences kind of a self erasure or self dispossession, which I think if we analyze it uh, all the way uh, through, it results from a shrinking multicultural space. Now the final point I want to make is that as much as Nagas in my view should have the freedom to eat that what is locally and culturally validated, Animal and vegan activists, in turn, have the freedom to protest this in a non-violent manner. The problem in all of this, in this whole kind of episode, lies in the demand for and the subsequent imposition of a legal prohibition on a culturally validated dish. And this sets a very, I think, dangerous precedent in which the validity and morality of minority cultures in a country is adjudicated no longer in the public sphere, but by political and legal um, institutions. I think given the time, I think I will, will leave it here. Um, thank you so much, Yele. So I will make sure that the points that you all have raised, both Kieran and you, come up as I wrap it up as the chair. Uh, and if, as we wait for Aying, I don't see that her connection is on. So in order to save time and make sure that- here. Okay. Is she here? I think she is here. Okay. Um, if you have to, you have to give her co-hosting for for unmuting herself if she is here. Otherwise, perhaps we can we can we can. Uh, Zushama, why don't you try to contact her through WhatsApp or phone? while I give the time to Dr. Sam. Yeah, so that we can we can still make sure that she's, All right. she's on the, yeah. So Dr. Sam, are you, if you're here, I, let, let's time you at seven minutes so that we can hear your reflections and then we will make sure that we are trying to connect with Aying in the meantime. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dolly Kikan for the excellent introduction. Thank you, Naga Scholars Association, particularly Dr. Uh, Zukamo Yantan for this wonderful opportunity to be part of uh, the discussion on food politics. My co-panelists, uh, Dr. Ken Mai, Dr. Ella, uh, Dr. Ayn Beni. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you all, uh, though virtually. And I'm so glad uh, to know about your respective work on the question of food. I learned a great deal uh, listening to you. Thank you very much for your insights on the issue at hand. 
thank you also for joining us from various parts of the world now as noted uh, by my earlier panelists the prohibition of uh, commercial import and uh, trading of dogs and uh, sale of dog meat in nagaland should not be seen as an isolated event that took place somewhere in nagaland whose capital uh, city many indians do not even know maybe with uh, the prohibition on dog meat some so called animal rights activists and the so called mainland indians uh, came to check it anyway that aside as i said the dog meat ban cannot be an isolated one it is in fact part of the larger agenda of the hindutva forces to saffronize the indian public sphere saffronization as we all knew is the larger agenda of the hindutva forces that agenda includes many aspects such as imposition of uh, uh, the hindi language imposition of uh, hindu way of life if at all there is one way of hindu life imposition of hindu culture or homogen homogenization of um, india's multi multi cultures that is the hindutva forces part of one nation one culture theory uniform civil code eventually replacing the indian constitution with that of the hindu shastras and so on and so forth while i do not want to touch upon these aspects i urge the audience to see the linkages between the dog meat ban uh, uh, and the larger saffronization agenda of the hindutva forces and realization of such an agenda would obviously result in the tearing up of the multicultural fabric of the indian nation destruction of the tradition and the cultures of india's indigenous communities subjugation of dalits and other marginalized castes relegating the muslims and christians to second class citizens if one were to look at the larger politics of the hindutva forces across the country during the last two decades or so the way these forces being uh, bringing the cow into the political realm spiritual realm commercialization of cow's urine and dung establishment of go go vigyan anusandhan kendra establishment of gomata hospitals and unique ids for cow cows like other uh, numbers to of humans closing down the meat shops in uttar pradesh lynching of uh, muslims and dalits in the name of cow all should be seen as part of the larger hindutvization of the indian nation in whatever the remaining allocated time i would like to bring uh, forth the dalit experience with the food in india if you could um, i mean that is the topic that was given to i was asked to talk about if you would um, you could uh, recall the setting up of beef stall uh, in the students uh, annual uh, sukun festivals in hyderabad central university by the dalit students union beef festivals in the english and foreign language university and usmania university by the dalits and other progressive students and their unions have generated a great debate within the civil society in the public media and among the academics these beef festivals in hyderabad universities as you know have inspired similar festivals in numerous higher education institutions across india now how do we understand the celebration of beef or beef festivals in public domain and why do dalit students want to organize beef festivals in the space of higher education institutions also why do the right wing caste hindu students object to beef uh, eating now before some explanation on these questions i would like to to try and understand that the dalit is not a homogeneous community for that matter in india no state constituted community is a homogeneous one as a dalit community is regionally and uh, ethnically diverse and so their food as well what i'm trying to say is that there is nothing like dalit food but what is common throughout the dalit history is the denial of basic rights such as the right to food and water if at all there is a dalit cuisine and that cuisine developed across the country as a mode of survival and out of economic necessity we all knew that people in this country are divided on the base of caste religion ethnicity and other markers and those people who are divided around the question of caste are placed one above the other in a system of social hierarchy in this hierarchy the claim to superiority and the merit of the one 
depends on the making inferior of the other. People sustain the social hierarchy by constructing other hierarchies in their everyday life around the language they speak, dress they wear, locations in which they live, houses they construct, and food they consume, and so on and so forth. To give an example on the language aspect, I come from a Telugu language background. There is a huge difference between the Telugu spoken in various regions of Andhra Pradesh, and there is also a huge difference between the language spoken by the Brahmins, upper caste Hindus, backward communists, communities, Dalits and Adivasis and others. Similarly, the Hindu society divides, the, divides its caste into three social groups around the, around the question of food, a food division that uh, corresponds with the social division and caste and community lines, vegetarians, specifically Brahmins, non-vegetarians, that is meat, such as uh, chicken and mutton consumers, meat consumers. This category includes various uh, categories of non-Brahmins. And uh, thirdly, beef consumers, primarily the Dalits. In other words, Hindu caste hierarchy puts pure vegetarian Brahmins at the top, non-beef eating, non-vegetarians in the middle, and uh, beef eaters at the absolute bottom. Of course, in everyday life, this sort of food hierarchy does not exist. In fact, a recent national survey found that over 70% of the people that eat beef are from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, 21% are from the backward caste and only 7% belong to the upper caste. You know? Now, to go back to my initial questions, why do Dalit students want to organize beef festivals in the campuses? And why do mainly right-wing upper caste students object to beef eating? Although modern educational um, spaces like university belong to every citizen of this country, they were dominated and controlled by the upper caste for a long time. It's only in the last two decades that universities have began to welcome the entry of Dalits, Adivasis, backward caste, and other marginalized sections of our society. As long as the university spaces were dominated by the upper caste, their culture was hegemonic in all aspects of uh, university life, including the kind of food that was served in hostels, only those items of food that have been traditionally consumed by the Brahmins and brand Brahmins upper caste, varieties of vegetarian food, chicken and mutton items were served in the hostels. Although Dalits also consumed all varieties of food that are consumed by the upper caste, they are also traditionally habituated to eating beef on a regular basis. When Dalit students enter universities and hostels, they miss their traditional food. Interestingly, this is not the case with the upper caste students. What is being consumed in their home is also being served in the university hostels, and so they do not miss their food at all. The changing students' composition in universities has allowed certain questions to be raised about the nature of such public institutions and the, our so-called secular politics. Demanding that beef be served in the hostels, setting up a beef stalls as part of cultural events, publicly consuming beef, and in fact, celebrating it as a festival ought to be therefore seen as a political challenge to vegetarianism and cultural assertion of Dalits and other marginalized groups. Dr. Sam, sorry, can you wrap it up? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, uh, just a minute. I, I mean, I just wanted to take a look at like one argument uh, on this around this you know, Hindu culture or even Indian culture. This of course begs this question whose culture is defined as Hindu. I mean, they object to the beef festival as a, you know, not part of a Hindu culture. Now, historians have asserted that eating the meat of cows was a common practice among all castes, including Brahmins and Saints in India. They've also pointed out the vegetarianism became a Hindu virtue only after the challenges thrown up by the Buddhism and Jainism. And further, it is during the 19th century nationalist mobilization in North India that the cow became a holy symbol of Hindu religion and a rallying point. Now, just to uh, conclude, uh, you know, um, my concluding point is that, you know, uh, uh, you know, vegetarianism now, uh, uh, you know, vegetarian or non-vegetarian became part and parcel of all, uh, all everybody's cuisine, but, you know, Hindutva force imposition could be kind of, you know, we have to see as a larger uh, self in politics. You know, we should remember that uh, these 
democratic arguments i mean like whatever the argument that we put you know um, you know they're part of this uh, democratic arguments if you see that in the public sphere but uh, they will have some kind of you no know, salience if hindutva forces are also believed in democratic argumentation we knew that the hindutva forces neither believe in democracy nor democratization they mastered the art of electioneering and by using the state power and the judiciary to a large extent in their hands the hindutva forces are doing what they wanted for a long time hindutvaizing the dalits and forcing them to convert to vegetarian diet in gujarat is some uh, something we need to take into account imposing uh, uh, on dog meat is also i mean ba uh, banning the dog meat is also to be seen in this larger context of saffronization of the indian public sphere mobilizing all the affected parties and gaining political power is the only way through which we can protect the multicultural fabric of india thank you so much um thank you so much so um i am really learning a lot from all the three panelists and i'm very excited to invite our uh, four panelists dr aying if she's able to join us now um so i would like to call upon the chamo to see if dr aying can join us i think we're having an amazing conversation yes aying hi yes yes hi yes, dolly minutes, so please time yourself yeah Right. Okay okay thank you Dr Dolly and also NSA for the opportunity and also to all my co-panelists hello to all of you and also to all who have joined in from different parts of the world a big hello from Nagaland and I did a little survey in preparation for this uh, panel talk and 248 of them participated in the survey and you will be surprised to know that since this discussion comes at the immediate backdrop of the ban on the commercialization of dog and its meat in Nagaland by cabinet on July 3 i did a little survey and i was surprised actually by the findings for 248 participants and 57 of them said that they eat dog's meat and that's uh, across different uh, professions and the age group is between 16 uh, sorry 18 to 60 years and also uh, only 43% of them said that they are against or they do not eat dog's meat so i think it is a huge population going by that statistics and so the band i think deserves uh, our discussion and also our attention and so i think this this topic on food politics in the backdrop of the ban on the commercialization of the dog in its meat i think is very relevant and so i want to say thank you and uh congratulate the nsa for bringing about this discussion well i believe that it is the prerogative of the government to formulate a law to protect the interests of its citizens but apart from the pressure by the fiapo i was wondering what is the rationale of the ban could it be an indigenous reason and you know that the pfa has accused that uh, the nagas have eaten all the dogs meat and so for one moment i was thinking perhaps the accusation is correct because uh, maybe we have finished the dogs population and therefore it is a threat to the species and so the government has banned it but of course on 21st july we read from the media that the slaughter of dogs meat uh, was not permissible according to the fssai regulation 2011 and i was wondering and i was also of course i wanted to ask the question is there a food legislation in the world that is so comprehensive that it covers all species and all types of food in the nation and dr dolly you have been to living and you have been in many places and so i think you would know that i don't think there is a food legislation that comprehensive to cover the entire type or species of food and as you know india is not only a microcosm but also a federal country and the reality is such that we need better understanding of food habits across the different states and also between the more than 2000 ethnicities in the country 
And so personally, I think the ban of food is justified on four grounds. And uh, first of all, if that food in question is a threat to the consumer's health. Secondly, if the animal in question is of an endangered species. Or thirdly, if it is religiously offensive to a group of people in a particular time and place. Or of course, or fourthly, if the issue is or concerns a wider public health and safety. And I think that dog's meat falls into none of this category that merits a ban. And so I think a ban on dog's meat and commercialization of dog is, I, I think, undoubtedly very unjustified. And re going back to that uh, survey that I did, 61% of those who participated said that they were against the ban and only 39% said that they agreed to the, the ban. And um, this evening's participants, possibly you come from beyond the state of Nagaland. So let me uh, add that so far, there is no dog farming in Nagaland for mass commercialization. In fact, until only in my adulthood, I hear of people selling puppies. In, in our childhood, we were, say, we were told that puppies and kitties were never sold because it is a taboo to sell them. And so puppies and kittens were freely given and taken. And it is only very recently that dogs are being sold and bought and also uh, the ornamental dogs, those that are imported. It's a very recent phenomenon, I can say. And some households, some households rear not only dogs, but they also rear other animals like hen, rooster, pigs, uh, goats, and also local breed of dogs for food. And they are not done on large scale. It's uh, maybe in one household you may see a few, a few uh, animals being reared. In recent times, of course, people have commercialized chicken rearing. But apart from that, dog is a, it's never, never reared for commercial purpose. It's, it's, uh, it's for family consumption. And that also mostly the local breed, not the imported ones. And for those families that keep dogs and cats as pets, usually they do not eat the meat of those. All of these pets, they normally die of all age and are buried. And so I, I think uh, we have to understand that in a Naga household, there is uh, even a dog meat is just a meat if it is reared for uh, meat purpose. So there is no uh, meat hierarchy you see in the Naga household. And so I agree with uh, the different animal rights organization that cruelty to animals, and of course cruelty to anything, including plants, is a moral and ethical concern, and I think it must be addressed. But the question that I want to ask is, how can slaughtering anything for food be moralized without obvious racial implications? So I want to leave the viewers with that question. Thank you, Dolly. Wow, we have four amazing panelists and as the chair, I'm a student because I'm taking continuous notes and I'm, I'm going to be very selfish now. I'm going to take this time and the privilege of the chair to ask all the four panelists one or two questions to, in a sense, just perhaps open up uh, the, the conversations that you are offering to us. And after that round is done, I would like to open it up to the audience we have 98 participants very eager, I think, to, to participate in this amazing, amazing conversation. It's not every day that we have, we have um, uh, an eclectic, I think, uh, speakers and thinkers across, across the board, from, from Dalit food 
to, I think, anthropological take on the omnivore, carnivore, to looking at nutrition in India and, you know, the, the animal world and the indigenous world and what does it mean to eat? What does it mean to slaughter? Can we eat then without, without in a sense of understanding the ethics of violence? Um, I think it's amazing, this panel. I'm just going to start with uh, Kiran. If Kiran is um, here listening, Kiran, as the chair, I would like to take the privilege in a sense, perhaps to ask you about your take uh, on, on nutrition. And I think this is where I'm going to perhaps prod you a little on this amazing wealth that you have as a food writer in India and also somebody who started one of the most, I think, dynamic restaurants in New Delhi, um, or Gunpowder in Hoskas in 2009. And you're also known as a Julia Child of India in terms of food and, and the kind of work that you have done with the Edible Archives. I'm very happy that in a sense, you bring in nutrition and towards the end of the talk, you do emphasize that along with class, income level, and how society connects with food. One of the things that we have to remember in a country like India is the caste factor and how that is important. So the last point in a sense that you were making is about, is about the menu. So Kiran, I'm gonna ask you a very personal question as a chair. When you were making the menu for let's say gunpowder or when you were thinking about curating a living archive like the edible archive, which is online, which all of us can see, how do you see a diverse country like India on a menu? Are there shortcomings and what are the challenges that you have faced as, as somebody who's envisioned as a philosopher, as a sociologist, as somebody who's so grounded in the practice of offering food as a way of thinking about citizenship. Uh, for uh, Yale, uh, thank you so much. So can I just give the questions and then we'll, we'll go back to the panelists here. For Yale, the, the question that I have for you is this fascinating um, world that you meet, uh, that you bring to us as, as, as your audience this evening. If Karen is offering us the lens of food, you offer us very specifically the lens of meat, right? And you bring in, you bring in the, the, the boundary between legitimacy and illegitimacy. Who decides what is legitimate and illegitimate? And I think right there, you bring in contested taste and the contestation of what is food and not food, and how do we, in a sense, I think, uh, think through this, both as anthropologists, we come from the same training and the same discipline, but both in a sense of looking at citizenship in a country like India. Um, there are two very important factors that you draw our attention to. The first one is actually thinking about multiculturalism in a country like India. And that's a very important point that actually also connects to what Dr. Sam shared with us. Because when we think about multiculturalism in India, this debate was there right there in the 1990s as well. As early as 1996, when the BJP was making a national um, uh, manifesto for its elections, they did in a sense, I think mention the national beef ban very, very clearly, which then happened in 2011 with the Supreme Court of India making a landmark judgment. So I would like to actually bring your anthropological thinking hat on and, and tell us how do we in a country like India then think about and negotiate this really fracturous landscape between protesters, right? The food rights activists, and also in a sense of vegans, in a sense of vegetarianism, in a sense of those who are eating meat. And really this, this, this place of conflict that we are seeing and no other time I feel in recent times, after the beef ban, are we seeing this conversation emerge like the one that is emerging with the dog meat ban, right? So in a sense, I think this is where I would really like to hear your, your thinking as, 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 as a way forward to, to lead us to. Um, Dr. Sam, I'm, I'm sorry that I had to cut you short in this very, very amazing uh, conversation, uh, reflective moment that you were giving us. And I think you tell us something very wise about how the dog meat ban should not be seen in isolation. Right? And as a Naga anthropologist myself, this is act act actually something that came to my mind when I was thinking about a dog meat ban. In 2017, 
I was perhaps one of the very few writers who had written on the ban. So when the 2020 ban did take place, my 2017 essay just went viral. So people didn't understand whether I was writing in 2017 or 2020. Oh. And so I had to actually keep on correcting them. I would, I would tell them, you're reading a you're reading a, an essay that was like written three years ago. My new essay in 2020 is out in front line, right? So even the confusion that was there. And I think your, your wisdom in, in, in connecting the ban, the ban culture, the concept of food and bringing in the Dalit experience and the Hindutva experience, I think it's very, very important for the audience who are here, right? Because in a sense, this is where we are understanding citizenship. And if there's something that connects, the beef ban, of course, the beef ban is part of Article actually uh, 48 of the Constitution. So it's a constitutional uh, groundedness as well. But one thing that connects both the dog meat and the beef is the, the thing, the, the Prevention of Cruelty Act uh, 1960 that brings us together. <laughs> and so I think in a sense, that becomes very, very important. I would like to really um, perhaps right now, as I'm giving you a question, bring on the Beef Festival 2012. And in a sense, the aftermath of the politics of the ban. I, I know for a fact that in the last few years, the lynchings that have gone on. So in a sense, I think the majority of, of students who are, who are the story I feel that they need to know about. Uh, Aying, thank you so much for this very, very wonderful um, uh, reflection that you have given us. And I would like to, I think given your training, given your training and your amazing uh, uh, wisdom in thinking about the dog legislation, the food legislation, you, you did ask me about food legislation and how is it in other places of the world. Uh, today in Melbourne, I went to, it's, it's Saturday, so I went to buy my food. And right here in Victoria Market, so if you come to Melbourne, Victoria Market is one of the heritage markets you go to. You see crocodile meat, you see emu, you see kangaroo, and these are national animals, right? <laughs> um, and, and kangaroo, remember, in Australia is a pest, right? Farmers hate the kangaroo. But at the same time, pretty much like the dog in India, right? The dog in India, we, we, we look at it from ethical lens, but the dog in India, if you, if you read the literature coming out from urban studies, the dog is a pest. People have no idea what to do with that. So in a sense, I think Aying that, that perhaps answers your question about food legislation and better understanding of food, what do we do? I think your thing in a sense would, would be interesting to see how you would respond to someone like Dr. Sam, because you put in four points about the, the conditions where we can stop eating meat. And one, one of the conditions you, 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 you invoke is actually uh, if the meat is offensive to a particular culture and a community, right? Uh, and so in India, if we look at regionally, out of 29 states, 24 states have banned meat in, and they have different kinds, kinds of legislations you know, which are, some are strict, some are not strict. And the beef ban in some of the states in India actually is a life imprisonment up to seven years. Right? Um, and so in terms of that, how did we negotiate that? And, and, and what, what kind of thinking should we have as, as Nagas, as you know, invoking a traditional culture of, of, of eating uh, dogs, you raise a very important question, Aying, about the commercialization aspect, right? That the ban just came in. And, you know, just some very few markets in Nagaland were selling the dogs and it was portrayed in national, on national camera. So perhaps this is where I would like to push you a little bit and, and, and think us through the, the point of the offense, right? If it's offensive. So, so in the in the case of the dog meat, it, it was offensive, perhaps to animal animal rights activists, and you know they they worked on it. So, what kind of offenses should we take cognizance to in a multicultural uh, setting like India? So, I have rambled on like crazy, and I'm like really going overboard with with my privilege as chair. But how about can I give you all uh, perhaps like three minutes each? Is that would that be okay? And then we'll, and I'm sure the audience will have many more questions. So can we start with Kiran? Kiran, can I, can I call you? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Sam, 
I, I rambled away so much, I think I should have come to the point, uh, which I think I should try now. Uh, you know, you, uh, you kind of ended up with uh, what is offensive. It's really interesting because when, you know, when I came up with the menu for gunpowder, a lot of the food that we served was meat. You know, I mean, there was a huge vegetarian, this thing, but also all kinds of meat, which normally in many Delhi restaurants was not available. Of course, we couldn't serve beef, but there was uh, buffalo meat, buff as it is called. Uh, but apart from that, one of the things that I found very interesting is uh, a lot of uh, Delhiites who would come to the restaurant would ask, uh, how come you don't have uh, boneless chicken? So I would say, but that's not how it is eaten at home. And this is the way people eat. And so, you know, I was really trying to tell people this is what a good part of not just the South, we called it the Peninsula Kitchen. Uh, because there is, uh, if you look at the figures, uh, even a graphic figure such as meat eating in India, it kind of cuts diagonally across India, covers the entire Northeast and the South. And I remember in a seminar, uh, Dean Jha said India should be seen in these diagonal, the meat eaters and the non-meat eaters. So I came from not only this meat eating position uh, with regards to the menu, but even with edible archives, <coughs> if you look at the diagonal again, the meat eaters and the non meat eaters also more or less are divided in between the rice eaters and the non rice eaters. So uh, the rice was the main part of the edible archives. It was basically trying to recover very indigenous uh, varieties of rice. So um, also the idea being that there is this non-market, non-commercial uh, culinary landscape, which needs to be showcased, which also talks about a lot of marginality, you know, marginal, uh, uh, you know, ingredients. I think I'll end here. Thank you so much, Kiran. As always, it's so amazing to hear about your knowledge. Uh, Ayin, can I call upon you? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Dolly, again. Yeah, I emphasized on um, the fact that uh, maybe a food ban is uh, justified if uh, it is religiously offensive. And I think uh, that comes down again to how the, the citizens uh understand each other's food habits or even the religion and the culture of a particular people like uh, if any for any one of us i, I think it is uh, it is a very common sense that we do not uh, eat in front of people when they're fasting especially during the uh, the fasting days of some religions we would normally not eat pork in front of our Muslim friends. And of course, I think if there are Hindus who do not take uh, beef for religious reasons, that we will not offend them by taking it in front of them. I think that is only common sense. And as I have mentioned in my introduction as well, we are a country of uh, so many ethnicities. And I think that is important if we want to coexist uh, together and if we want to still reaffirm the idea of being an Indian I think that sensitivity is very important but having said that I also want to um, maybe talk in terms of metaphor as Yela has also pointed out I think it is very rude to go into somebody's kitchen and check their pot to see what they are cooking isn't it and so I think that influence and the pressure that came from some of the animal rights organization and that influence on the government of Nagaland, I think it was very rude. And it is very sad on the part of the government to have given in to that pressure. If only they had not uh, fought culture by using culture, I think it would have made more sense. But that is what we have seen in what has happened. And of course, on the other hand, it is also, I would say, equally insensitive, insensitive 
to go to someone's home with your tiffin. I think you, I think you understand very well. And that is only acceptable if you are an infant, biologically and culturally. So I think that, that metaphor uh, is all I have to say with, uh, in response to your question. Um, Dr. Yele? Dr. Yele? Wutes? Yes. I can. Hi, I the time is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dolly, and thank you to the other panelists. Um, I would like to agree with Dr. E about the importance of being sensitive and the idea of, of multi, um, um, mutual respect. Now, in terms of food habits, now in terms of multiculturalism, the, the specific question uh, Dolly raised, or rather the undermining of it in the contemporary historical moment, what we witness um, in terms of the ban on dog meat, but I agree with Dr. Sam that this is not an isolated case. What we witness is that culture is moving towards the courts and to the domain of legislation. But this is arguably not where culture should reside. Culture should arguably reside outside political institutions, at least to an extent, but it should certainly reside outside legal institutions, and especially in relation to, to food. So in terms of ethics or philosophy of governance, one could argue, and I think quite convincingly so, that no government should enter any, any kitchen. So what I would like to emphasize in particular, and this is directly in relation to the dog meat ban, is how the Nagaland government is seeking to constrain and quote unquote correct the food habits of the people it is supposed to represent and defend. So what is more, mm -hmm. this legislation, the legislation against the trade and consumption or the cooking of, of dog meat amounts in a way to an act of, uh, to an act of apology. It is the Nagaland government apologizing. They are apologizing to the nation for what are age old, culturally validated, culturally authenticated food habits. They are apologizing for the existence of Naga taste buds that some may not deem to be properly Indian. They are apologizing for churning the stomachs and sentiments of mainstream society. But I think we should be very careful and we should question whether genuine cultural difference, of which food is a major example, should really be reduced to the realm of apologies. I, for one, think that it should not. And I think I will end it, end it here. Thanks, Yele. Thank you so much. Dr. Sam. The time is yours now. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, of course, you know, this is a, you know, not an isolated one. It's all, uh, you know, definitely with the, to do with the politics, basically. Because um, as, you know, uh, my earlier panelists, you know, LA and then you know, Aying, have been uh, talking about this, um, uh, you know, it, um, you know, it uh, actually the imposition you know, tears the multicultural fabric. We have been for generations together, for centuries together. We are, you know, living what we are. You know, you know like you, know, you eat, uh, you know, some people eat dog, some people eat, you know, beef, you know, buffalo meat, or you know, uh, uh, all that. But now suddenly, you know, the these right wing forces coming and then asking me not to eat beef or asking you not to eat, you know, dog meat. You know, that's actually, I mean, and also asking you to kind of follow certain cultural trends, you know, that's actually expensive, isn't it? I don't know, like, um, you know, for example, you know, I, um, if I, uh, if I cut, uh, and if I kill cow uh, in the house of, um, you know, a Brahmin, that is definitely religious offensive. But, you know, if that is kind of, you no know, some, uh, animal, not cow, but you know, maybe ox or anything. If they cut outside, you know, that's kind of you know, you know, uh, raised by a farmer. You know, how that is going to be being, you know, uh, offensive. I don't understand. There's another also another argument is that, see, for example, like uh, now, um, this food item is kind of an offensive. You know, for the sake of argument, I can say that you know, the vegetables that you are eating, you know, the um, lady's finger, ochroch or, you know, um, you know uh, uh, cabbage or cauliflower, you know, I would say that, you no, know, it's my goddess. 
you know, how can you eat? You know, if you look at you know, for the sake of argument, you know, um, if somebody says that you know that you know dog is my god or you know cow is my god, you know, yeah, perfectly. If it's your god, you worship them. But you know, why to impose you know your own view on me because I don't believe. You know, it's simply a case of like you know, because you know somebody is having a political power and somebody is kind of you know imposing you know sheer you know, their beliefs upon others who don't believe. You know, thereby actually destroying their agency, their uh, you know culture, culture tradition, their history, and everything. That's what like in you know, a way I'm trying to understand. You know, basically, in 1958, and if you look at you know Supreme Court uh, judgment, you know they said um, you know uh, after a cow kind of in you know, the past 17 years, you know that will become redundant. You know, it old, and then they won't able to kind of you know. And then uh, they allowed us the Supreme Court. allowed to kind of you no know, people to use it you know send it to slaughter houses and then even in the you know everyday you know farmers life if you look at you know they will actually send it to give it to the people who use it you know, for different purposes like you know, after 70 years you know when it's kind of you no know, lost uh, so it is actually sheer uh, you know using political power imposing uh, you know one's beliefs upon others you know, nothing else actually I mean, if you look at, if you kind of boil it. So much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I I think the four speakers are amazing, and I could I could I could keep listening to your take. Very sharp. I think all of you, in a sense, very very um, deep in 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 what you're forcing us to think as an audience. I, as the chair, would like to now open up the the floor, the digital floor, to to questions that you have. um and so you can either uh, i would like to request an aga scholars association to un unmute people perhaps if they want to ask questions or if you have uh time you can also chat you can also put the questions in chat uh make sure that you address it to the particular panelists that you want to ask the question that would be good um and so so perhaps i'm waiting as i'm waiting to hear from the the audience in terms of questions that you have please do keep it short and make sure that in a sense you know it generates conversations um and so yeah would you all like to go ahead and i hope you all know the zoom etiquette there is a place where you can raise your hand and the the organizers will come and unmute you and then you can ask your question uh, or, or, or also feel free as i'm looking at the chat also please feel free to post your questions on chat i'm happy to take it as a chair and give it to the uh give it to the speakers so as i'm waiting there is a first question that's here for dr aying beni um one of the participants wants to know aying beni why are some food habits seen as savage and 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 really primitive i i think it's in the in relation to the dog meat ban that that a lot of people are are angry and are 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 also offended that this is seen right as a savage food practice which needs to be stopped so aying this is a question for you Can the organizers please unmute Aying? You need to unmute. Thanks. Oh, sorry about that. Can you hear me now, Dolly? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, I All right, I think the problem is with the cultural hegemony as one of the speakers have also pointed out and the attempt I think to kind of colonize the minorities. that is the problem that we are seeing here a kind of a that, that is a very another kind i would say that that is a very blatant racism and i sometimes wonder why sometimes we take offense when people say that nagas eat anything that crawls you know it's not just things that crawl they also eat things that fly and they swim and they're quite open to uh, food items and not only that but they're also open to uh, the mainland indian food they adjust very well when they go to hostels in 
and go for studies in other parts of India and also in other parts of the world, they do adjust quite well. And so I think in terms of food habits, they have their own and they love those uh, savory, spicy food, but they are also very open to other palates, you know. And so I think of the kind of uh, that the cultural hegemony, which some of the uh, majority Indians in the sense, uh, not in terms of population, you should, I think we all know that yet only 20% of Indians are vegetarians and 80% are non-vegetarians as much as we would like to believe otherwise. And of course, I think the facts and figures show that India also is uh, one of the top 10 producers, uh, highest producers of uh, beef and chicken and also mutton. And so I think uh, that, that few group of people and yet still powerful are the ones who are trying to impose or uh, set, set the tune for that cultural hegemonization. And I think that is something that the, the other ethnicity need to resist and we need to confront because I believe that there is no hierarchy in food. Food, food does not uh, classify a person as high or low. It is just a matter of preference. It's just a matter of taste. And what is food if it does not satisfy a palate or food is only as good as it satisfies a palate. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have we have two questions for Dr. Yale. The first one is about uh, food habits in Bhutan and also about uh, you know just the meat culture there. And the second question that's that's there for you, Yale, it's it's about the with the the shrinking um, what do you call it? yeah the shrinking uh, multicultural space. What is the way forward in a in a country like India? Unmute yourself, Yale. Unmute yourself, please. I I saw the the question on the on the food culture in in Bhutan, and the question I would like to take a little issue. I mean, in a in a constructive sense, with the the way it is phrased, because it is asked whether um, people in Bhutan eat exotic uh, kind of meats. Now, I would like to argue, and I think. Uh, Dr. Ying would agree with this, that there is no such thing as exotic meat, right? Because whether or not meat is uh, legitimate or not legitimate, right, is again a question of, of religious and cultural value. So I don't think we can objectively call a particular meat exotic and another kind of meat non-exotic. Now, regarding the second point, I'm, I'm not really sure whether I have any solution to offer. But I would like to emphasize this, and um, this is also what I've argued in a, in a recent uh, op-ed in the in the Statesman, is that multiculturalism is not, as such, primarily under threat when a majority community actively prohibits a minority community from doing or eating certain dishes. I think it becomes much more serious when multiculturalism is already diminished to such an extent that minority communities feel the need to self-censor, to self-erase, and to apologize for their cultural predilections, including in the case of the Naga, the uh, consumption among some communities of, of dog meat. And I think this is a, a very serious point that, in, that, that, is, uh, that runs through this whole kind of, 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 of recent issue. Thank you so much. I think um, there's a there's a there's a comment that's that that's there on the chat, uh, which is which is very uh, very I think how can I say important for us to think about, and it's uh, it's about food surely as a matter of choice, but when it, it is a threat to the to the human body, uh, what do we do about it? And I think this is this is this is a question for perhaps. Uh, the, the panelists to think about one of the one of the first the first there are three there there are three acts right legal legal acts under which the dog meat is banned and as a chair let me make that clear the first is under the Food Safety and Standard Act of two thousand and six where it says that dog meat 
is unhygienic and it cannot be categorized as meat fit for human consumption. The second one is under the Indian Penal Code 429, which has to do with injury or killing any kind of animal. And there is very specifically, whether it's cow, buffalo, it's named, or it says any other animal. According to IPC 429, it is a cognizable offense. And by cognizable offense, it means that you can be arrested without a warrant. The third act under which the dog meat is banned is under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act 1960. And if you look at section 11, it, it is one of the longest sections in this act, in this uh, Cruelty Against Animal Act in India. It has three sections. The first clause has 15 sub clauses. The second section has one and the third section is kind of, I think up to five sub clauses. It is a comprehensive act right there. And so in a sense, I have been getting a lot of questions from young people around saying that there is a misunderstanding because the government of Nagaland does allow the consumption of dog, but you can imagine under three laws, the ban has been imposed. So in a sense, perhaps one of the important things for me as a chair to also sound out to the participants would be this, this, this legal, legal ban that's very important. Um, the, so, so perhaps in terms of safety and, and at what point should it be safe or unsafe to eat an animal? Can I, can I place the question to perhaps uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Kiran? What exactly is your question? I'm sorry. Kiran, Hello? at what point? So, so one, of the, one of the comments on the chat is, you know, uh, at what, what point as, as, as consumers, if we are talking about choices, should we, should we limit the idea of choice when it comes to unsafe, eating unsafe animals? Uh, well, I think first it has to be decided what is unsafe. You know, I mean, uh, that's highly uh, contentious. Uh, unless a, a, a species literally going extinct, uh, I don't think unsafe to who to the animal to the to the human uh, so these are contentious issues and till such contentions are decided i think banning any meat for any community i think is uh, to eat uh, that's my position uh, first of all you know so unsafe is a very, um, I don't know, it is really contentious. Um, can, I, can I pose that question to Dr. Sam? Hello? Dolly, uh, what's the question? The question, is that, the question is about who decides what is safe or unsafe to eat. <laughs> uh. I mean, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Like, you know, for example, you know, um, at home, it's a parent decides. And then uh, in society, it appears, you know, people who are in the power decides like, you know, what is unhygiene and then what is not hygiene. I mean, you know, um, you know, my eight year, uh, oh, eight year old daughter, she, you know, questions all the time, like, you know, you know, I eat what I want, you know, why are you forcing me or why are you doing this to me? Uh, in a sense, like, you no, know, she's not allowing me to decide, although I'm sort of, a, you know, father figure, I'm a, a father. Uh, so, you know, I, I think um, it is the consumers that should be given the right to decide, like, you know, what is hygiene, what is not hygiene. You know, you know, my body will not kind of allow me to eat if something is not, uh, you know, good for my body, you know, health. So I think, uh, you know, it, is, it should be the individual choice rather than like somebody, you know, saying to me, like, you know, what is good to me, what is uh, bad to me, you know, or hygiene or non hygiene. Yeah, like, can I, can I give you that question? Unmute, please. Yes, yes. I would just like to concur with, uh, with Dr. Sam, the question whether, uh, me, uh, particular food is safe or unsafe, I think the final um, decision on that is my stomach. It is not 
the it's not a court it's not a political party right i think this uh, and this this feeds into my larger point that all this kind of discussions about food habits right what should be eaten what shouldn't be eaten should not be brought into or should not be moved to the court this is something to be discussed in the public sphere right and food habits may change over time they may evolve right all of that is is perfectly uh, perfectly fine but it just becomes in my mind it becomes quite dangerous when uh, this kind of questions about safety or hygiene or what is legitimate and what is not legitimate in terms of what we um, insert in our in our body what we eat right when it is moved to um, to the legal and political institutions where they do not belong Ian. yes <laughs> Doc, maybe, maybe I'll, i will take that question from the audience at first value and give you an example you know pork is a favorite of the nagas among the many uh, meat items and the district from where i come from pak they have uh, banned the import of uh, pork uh, for slaughtering since 200 uh, 2000 sorry 2000 so it's it's a good 20 years and one of the reasons is because uh, they want to ensure that the consumers do not consume those uh, uh, the pig that is coming out from outside which is injected with a lot of uh, uh, unhealthy uh, doses of whatever and so it's been 20 years and the community vigilance is working very well and people in peg district they eat only those um, uh, pork that are locally cultivated which means that the pig also eat the same food which the, the human beings eat so it is a very healthy as we, we can imagine and so i think um, we have heard from our local local people that the dog's meat in fact is not an unhealthy food as i have mentioned in the introduction most of what the nagas eat is locally bred yes if the government had said that all right those dogs that are coming from outside of nagaland they are straight dogs and they also not immunized they are not safe in terms of uh, disease and all that then we we can somehow appreciate the government's move but you know that that part is missing from the legislation on oh, not on the legislation yet the directive and so we we can imagine how the local people are responding to it because now they are saying that no dog's meat is not at all not unsafe because it is good for they they, they are now listing what the dog meat is good for it is good for typhoid it is good for as a good cure for malaria it is also very good for healing wounds and especially for uh, women after giving birth it 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 is a really good for bringing back that healing in their body and so they are making a list of things that are good uh, good for the health i don't know the signs of it maybe there is a need to do some kind of uh, more in depth research perhaps I, i want to believe that it is not just a placebo effect but perhaps it is tried and tested that it is really maybe good for some uh, certain ailments and i think there are proof of it there are people who say that i have eaten it and it has cured my ailment so i i think as uh, the speakers earlier have said the the hygiene is one part but this, but the the benefit is also one thing that we need to look into um thank you i th- i think excellent amazing conversations wow and i'm so happy this is being recorded because i'm going to go back and listen to all the wise things that you guys have said as the chair i have some uh questions for you all once again and i think um i will start with uh, yele the question for you here um the the audience is posing is how does it in a sense affect article 371a i think you have worked on that for a long time so so one of the debates is coming up is also you know it's going against this constitutional provision where naga people have the right to their culture which includes perhaps food habits so how is it clashing with that um dr kiran the the question for you here is that in a sense if we have to imagine then dogs as as livestock 
as somebody who's worked on food and nutrition in a sense in the country, what are the challenges, right? Uh, what are the challenges and how can we think about animals as, as livestock in this really uh, fractured landscape? Um, the, the third question in a sense goes to Dr. Sam. So there's a question where they're asking if you can see the dog meat ban as linked to Hindutva, right? As linked to a Sanskritization where it's coming to the Northeast and it's also really affecting tribal states like, like Nagaland. Um, so when you talk about Hindutva and the cow and the beef thing, you know, the dog is something that's completely disgusted. You know, it's not sacred. It's the opposite of sacred. Right? It's repulsive. So how is it linked? I think, I think your, 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 your insight will be very helpful. Um, and and Aying, once again, the question here is that, do you see this as part of a larger Hindutva uh, a politics of saffronization where there's so much kind of politics going on? And one of the things in India that, that, that animal rights and also in a sense, the, the, the idea of rights have always set on the edge is that, you know, the, the, the and that's something I wrote about it as well, the, the intersection of, Animal rights and Brahmanism, right? That as though a particular kind of compassion is greater, right? That a vegetarian compassion is greater than a non-vegetarian compassion. And I think that kind of mindset that drives the country towards animal rights is quite dangerous. So in a sense, perhaps I will give you the second round of questions here to, to um, uh, set, set, set you about. So can I start with, um, Dr. Kiran. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to sort of uh, think about this. Um, can, I, can you repeat the question? I'm a little confused exactly what you asked. I'm sorry. Dr. Kiran, about livestock, right? So there's a, so it, it's- Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so. So, uh, you know, I think um, I'll start with a very personal note in the sense uh, I have a farm in Uttarakhand and uh, the people there are devout Hindus. They venerate their, uh, uh, the cow we have on our farm and yet they have very practical orientation towards animals and animal slaughter. You know, so uh, I think if we start looking from a, a very practical orientation, just about all animals can be consumed. You know, a meat is a meat is a meat, you know? And I think a lot of this discourse around dog meat also, uh, there is of course this uh, very divided, uh, you know, animal uh, divided uh, landscape in India, which is uh, meat versus vegetarianism. And vegetarianism also rides on animal rights uh, discourse. So they kind of, come together, you know, uh, because earlier nobody talked about dog meat. And I think it has also to do with animal right activism, which has become quite rife across social media and so on and so forth. So uh, I think if we, for once, I wish somebody would take a very practical approach to all these problems. With so many dogs in India, which has become actually a problem. If I were a policymaker, I would say, you know, let them be harvested, if that is the word, you know, forget about farming, you know, we haven't even reached that stage. So uh, as I was saying, these people up, up in the farmlands and all are quite happy uh, to get uh, the some of their cows when they're not in use for slaughtering. And right now they're all suffering from this ban because uh, it has disturbed the economy and the equation that was existing beforehand. And these are people, believe me, who are very devout Hindus, who also have this practical aspect to them. So the everyday farmer is actually thinking very practically about these things, you know, so. Thank you. Yala, can I call you in here on Article 371A and dog meat? Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dori. Um, to me, and I think to, to many, it's a little it's a little confusing to understand why the Nagaland government decided to interfere in the kitchen and cooking pots of the very people it is meant to represent the fat. For one thing, there was no legal necessity for the government of Nagaland to do so. 
even as there were plenty of animal and vegan activists from other parts of India who invoked India's Prevention of Cruelty to the Animal Act, to Animals uh, Act, this act arguably does not really extend to Nagaland. I mean, this would need a very long historical and political discussion, but in brief, the enactment of Nagaland state in 1963 was an envisaged compromise to the Naga demand for independence. Statehood entailed that Nagas relinquished their claim for political sovereignty in exchange for political autonomy vested in inalienable cultural sovereignty. So this is enshrined in the constitution through a special amendment, as the question is about, which is Article 371A, which, among other things, elevates Naga's social practices and customs above any act of parliament. Now, food is not mentioned explicitly in Article 371A, but it is hardly difficult to convincingly argue, I think, that food habits are part of Naga's social practices and customs, which thus renders it constitutionally protected under Article 371A. And this, on the one hand, is evidence that Article 371A is perhaps not fully understood or perhaps not capitalized on to the extent that it could, or perhaps that it is being diminished, right? But what is quite clear, at least the way I see it, is that there was absolutely no legal necessity on the part of the Nagaland government to, date, to do what it did. Dr. Sam, can I call upon you to yeah. talk about the Indian band and dog meat connection? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You know, uh, 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 you know interestingly, this uh, dog, uh, you know, okay, cow, uh, rubber, you know, they rubber. But at the same time, you know, even a dog is also like, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, Hindu mythology, Dog is also like you know one of the gods, you know, in terms of you know Bhairava, you know there is. Uh, so you know, um, if you connect with this in you know, Hindu mythology, everything will be kind of you know, part and parcel of that, you know. So uh, yeah, you know, but you know, as I said, like you know, this is a larger um, Hindutva politics of uh, saffronization. One has to see, uh, you know, uh, they do not want Christians, Muslims, or. Uh, Okay, so you know what I'm trying to say that you know if you look at you know the way Babri Masjid has been demolished, these the way names have been changing, and then Christian churches are destroyed. You know nuns have been raped. Uh, you know the imposition of you know uh, the language and then you know taking out of um, democracy secularism aspects. You know from um, you know class uh, high school uh, textbooks. You know, various aspects, actually, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, these bands, everything. So, you know, uh, for them, Akhanda Bharat is uh, without, you know, Christianity, without uh, Islam, it's a completely Hinduized uh, nation. And so, you know, and then they take, particularly, they, like, you know, they will touch upon one aspect at a time, right? You know, it's kind of you know, now a beginning. Dog, for example, like, you know, uh, in Nagaland. You know, after uh, once they kind of you know, uh, succeeded in this, and then you know they will try to touch up on the next one. So it's kind of you know step by step, step by step at a time, like you know, one aspect kind of thing. Yeah. If you look at you know, the overarching, like you know, what they have been doing for the last 20, 30 years, you know, particularly when they are in the power or outside the power, how they have been kind of you know trying to saffronize the public sphere and then changing the educational system. You know, selling of the you know state uh, enterprises, uh, all that actually gives you some kind of that you know they're kind of you not know, trying to enter into north northeastern India. You know, the, you know, Adivasis are like you no know, not outside their purview. They're, you know, they're also like you no know, part and parcel of that larger, and so like you no know, they will do. You know, they're kind of you no know, coming uh, to northeastern as well. That's the point that I'm trying to say. That you know, it's kind of you no know, larger. Politics, you know, dog is kind of you know, one instant. That's kind of also it's just the beginning. You know, you would also encounter with you know some other things also. Like you know, one has to kind of you know, wait and see. But definitely, it's the beginning. I would say. Thank you, Doctor Sam. Um, Doctor Ayin, about about I think this is a connection, and and audiences are asking if you see this as as part of the 
Hindutva projects. So if Dr. Sen gave us a larger picture, what about Nagaland? Do you see this as a, as a very deep uh, interference? Can you unmute? You need to unmute, Dr. Yim. Yes, Dr. Dolly, I agree with what Dr. Sam has said. I think he has made it very clear that Hinduism is not just a religion, it is a lifestyle. And that uh, what I have also talked about earlier, that hegemony that they are trying to enforce, you know, by way of very subtle assimilation, just coming in very, maybe beautifully, in the guise of uh, animal protection, you know, coming into our uh, kitchen pots. And so I think uh, if we allow this uh, trend to continue, there will be no end to it. You know, Nagas, we eat a lot of greens. You know that very well. And those greens are farmed. They are grown in our kitchen gardens. They are also foraged in, the, in our jungles. And there seems to be also a hierarchy of the, of the vegetables, you know? What is grown in mainland India, that is what you have to eat. What, is, uh, what you forage from the jungles, it is a very primitive form of greens that you are eating. You know, th so th that is a problem. I think we need to really stand and challenge this assimilation that is happening. And uh, I think uh, it started from uh, the religion part and now it is coming right into our food habits. And so so I think that is a very dangerous thing that we need to recognize. Wow, I, I'm taking so much liberty, but there is one question that uh, a, a participant has been, has been uh, encouraging me to ask. And, and Dr. Kiran, sorry to bother you again, but this is, this is a very specific question for you. And, it's, yeah. and it says that according to the IFPRAI nutritional status in India, the Nagas show that they do quite well in terms of nutrition and health, and they're above the Indian average. So do you have a take on this? Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. In fact, uh, I kind of uh, started rambling a little bit, but I should have come straight to the point. When I was talking about nutrition and how some of the discourse around nutrition came from largely vegetarian backgrounds. And, uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, some of those states which introduce even something as simple as an egg in their midday scheme, midday meal scheme, the nutrition levels are much higher. The nutrition levels, uh, for instance, in all of the Northeast and the South is comparatively much higher than compared to the non-meat uh, eating, uh, you know, rest of India. I don't have the exact figures, but it's quite, uh, it's quite evident and uh, it's been there for a while. And not only that, uh, if uh, anthropologically, if you look at some of the hunter gatherers and the foraging uh, communities, they have much more complex meal structures, which uh, in a way uh, puts them, um, you know, at a much higher scale in terms of health and nutrition, Com you know, considering that we call them primitive. So yes, I, I tend to agree because uh, it's much more complex, especially foraging. I'm glad Ali has uh, brought the foraging aspect uh, because that's one of the parts which is completely missing from the discussion on nutrition or agroclimate or any of those other discussions. That's it. Uh, uh Thank you so much. We have gone above, like beyond two hours and I am completely a bad chair. I apologize to the panelists. I mean, this is an amazing, amazing uh, conversation on food, on politics. And I have a question and I kept it for the last. And I just want to tell the participant, if you're still here in the webinar with us, I haven't forgotten you. And this was a very, very profound, deep question about animal rights versus the indigenous world, right? So in the 21st century, with so much animal rights campaign going on, what happens to indigenous people's food habits? And how do we then, in a sense, like the Naga case, negotiate about this? It's not even about sacred animal. It's not even about uh, you know, endangered animal. Here, I would say that there's a very warped notion of compassion, love, 
And there's a very warped notion of, of right that, that's coming in. It's, it's the ban came at a time. We just stopped every kind of debate and discussion around this. So this is a question I would like to take up as a chair and have the privilege about animal rights versus indigenous food habits and when, where do we see it? I would like to actually remind ourselves and also the audience and myself as an anthropologist that the more I look into whether it's environmental rights and animal rights, I think it'll, it'll help us to take a few steps backward to see that where in the world do this notion of rights come in? And as an anthropologist who works around political ecology and my first book being on mining, and I was trained in California and, and I work in Australia, which is a settler country. The entire basis of environmental rights is deeply seeped in colonialism and in race. Okay. So if you talk about environmental rights today, I would really encourage you all to talk about colonialism and how the idea of nature and wilderness in, in the United States, if you look at these beautiful parks, were actually redefined as natural beautiful parks by committing a genocide on the indigenous people of the land. So in the 21st century, even as we are talking about rights, animal rights, where do we, where do we draw the lines and how do we then reflect on this? And even for indigenous people like ourselves then, right? What is our responsibility? And I speak particularly as a non-anthropologist who's worked on human rights for the last 25 years. The losses that we have had, the structural violence that we have had, the forests that we have lost, the cultural essence, the prayers of our ancestors that we have lost. Right? Do we just see food as food without prayer? What about seasons? What about amazing accounts of foraging that Dr. Aying and Dr. Kiran are in a way pushing us to reflect on? What about hunting? Um, do we even know how to do it? Right? Do we even know how to forage anymore? Do we even know what is a forest anymore as indigenous people in the 21st century? What is our connection? And I think as much as then, perhaps my role as a chair would be that with this fascinating, amazing conversation that we could have only had with these four panelists. As much as we talk about rights, perhaps we need to reflect on the structural violence that we have also inherited in this. How do we reflect on this? And I think this is where Dr. Sam was also encouraging us to think about Dalits not being a homogeneous category, about Dalit literature showing that with pressure, a lot of Dalits are also becoming vegetarians. Right? That in a sense, as Naga, some of us are also very, very embarrassed about the history that we have about certain, certain eating habits. So where do we, in a sense, draw the line? As your chair, I'm being mischievous because I do not have the answers. And as listeners, as audience, we still have 82 members listening to us. It's going live on Facebook and the entire recording will be put up. Look up the works of these four amazing panelists. Continue to have a conversation with it. Look into Bahujan, Dalit, indigenous tribal writings, Adivasi writings on food and think about it. Right? Why is it that there's such a deep embarrassment, shame, and a fear that we have inherited in what we eat today? Right? Is it just specific to India? Or in a sense, is it, is it global? And I think with that note, I would like to take the privilege to thank our four amazing, amazing panelists where I've learned so much. And I would like to thank the Naga Scholars Association and now I would like to invite the Vice President of the Naga Scholars Association, Akam David, to come, uh, make yourself present and give us the vote of thanks. Okay. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Um, sometimes I forget I'm the chairperson, uh, I, I'm the vice President, I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, yes, um, introductions have already been made, but um, I guess uh, a vote of thanks is still in order. Um, we would like to, on behalf of the Naga Scholars Association, we would like to thank, first of all, the chairperson, Dr. Dolly Kikon, uh, the, two, the panelists, Dr. Yella Waters, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Eng Benny, Dr. Sam uh, Sambaya, the reporter, uh, Menokono, the technical support team, Prahlad, Kamlesh, and Ankush, 
and we have not yet um, introduced or um, mentioned uh, the person behind the flyer, the person who designed the flyer, Russell Humzoy. Thank you a lot, and thank you. Uh, thank. I, I, we would also like to thank all the participants for making this successful. Thank you all. So, so perhaps with that note, um, the, the webinar comes to an end and I would like to thank you all once again.